Well, uh, good morning everybody and thanks so much for getting up early, coming out and joining us. Uh, we, uh, we're in the middle of a, uh, a very important campaign at the moment and my job is to come around and talk to as many people as I possibly can and explain what it is that we're doing, why we're doing it and actually how part of what we're doing at the moment is, is really the result of a much longer journey um, that we've been, been on and uh, so I guess uh, this morning it's about getting that message through to you and then hopefully you'll get it through to as many other people as possible and the word will spread and uh, we can uh, make sure this campaign is as effective as possible. But I'd like to uh, put the campaign into some context before I tell you a bit more about it by actually starting, I guess, with... Uh, yeah, this doesn't seem to be working. With uh, the beginning of the journey. Now, when you say to people, uh, we work for a Chamber of Commerce, this is the image that most people have in their heads. Pale, male and stale. Uh, and, uh, this picture is actually the gathering of the, uh, the first gathering of the Chambers of Commerce in Australia back in the 1800s. Uh, uh, and, uh, so they are real Chamber of Commerce people, but uh, when I took this job four years ago, people said, so what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to be CEO of the New South Wales Business Chamber. And they went, that's the image they have in their mind, these guys here. Old guys sitting around smoking cigars in three-piece suits. Um, now, you know, the problem that we have is that sometimes the political uh, forces in this country also think of Chambers of Commerce that way. And so uh, we had a, a very big job on our hands, I think, to, to change the image of the Chamber movement, to change the way in which uh, uh, we were perceived, and, and also to, I guess, start to communicate the actual power that the Chamber movement uh, has and, and, and to unite the, the organisations to make sure that we actually get our voice heard. So we've moved on a fair way from there and the New South Wales Business Chamber today is a very modern, very large organisation. Um, we actually have uh, two major parts of the organisation. We have the, uh, the member services, the policy and the advocacy side, the traditional side of the Chamber if you like. But on the other side, a whole range of professional services organisations, a law firm, a recruitment firm, a group training company, a whole range of other uh, commercial operations. The aim of those commercial operations is to provide members and other businesses with uh, support to grow their business, to maximise their business potential. Uh, but members always access those services at a preferential rate uh, to non-members. And now having brought in the local chambers of commerce, those benefits are now being extended to the members of the local chambers as well. So today we're a dynamic organisation. We're out there looking for benefits for members. We've just introduced benefits in the areas of uh, energy consumption. So if you want to get a more competitive price on energy usage, we have a program where you can access that. Uh, uh, stationary supplies, a whole range of other bits and pieces. These are just add-on benefits to the core business that we operate. And we're starting now to explore how we can help any member who wants to get access to the booming Chinese market, the booming Indian market. We are starting to explore how we can open those gateways for them uh, and uh, to take away all of the, the risk and the pain involved in taking a small business into those markets. The Chamber is uh, at the moment, awaiting a nod from the federal government to, uh, to give us a little bit of uh, financial assistance to actually start opening up some of those gateways uh, for you in those countries. So that could be very exciting if any of you are considering or thinking about the opportunities presented to the north of the country uh, well, by the, this massively growing uh, middle class uh, market in some of those countries. Uh, watch this space because we'll come back to you in the next few months and tell you what we're doing in that space as well. I want to start putting some perspective around the campaign we're here to talk about today by going back a couple of years. Um, when I started in this job back in 2009, New South Wales was governed by a highly dysfunctional state government. Um, and it's not a controversy for me to say that because you've all been reading the papers, you've all seen the ICAC inquiries, you all know what was going on in New South Wales at the time. And I started as the CEO of the peak business organisation in this state and I thought, OK, well, this will be good. I'll be able to interface regularly with the state government and talk about things that business need. And you would expect that any government would want to have a conversation with business to say, what can we do to stimulate business? Because business, if it's stimulated, creates jobs. And you would think the natural inclination for a government would be to want to have conversations with business about what can we do to make the economy stronger? 
What can we do to grow jobs? What can we do to incentivise people to invest? That would be a natural conclusion that you would come to. And what I found was a government that didn't know those things and didn't care and didn't want to have those conversations and really couldn't care less. And in some ways they felt that business was actually getting in the road of other things that they had in mind and other things they wanted to do. And so it was a highly disappointing experience for me to come into New South Wales to find a government in the state that really didn't care and didn't want to know and didn't want to have the conversations. So we sat there and, and we said, well, there is an election in 2011 in New South Wales and we really have two choices. We can start back in 2009, 2010 to, to chart a course by which we make sure the next government in New South Wales is different, or we can put our hands up and say, well, that's just politicians, they'll never change, we just have to accept what we accept. We decided that it, we owed it to our members to actually go down the, the first of those paths. And so back in 2010, we created this concept. And the concept was that we would spend the next couple of years actively campaigning, actively educating everybody about the things that we believed were necessary to make New South Wales more prosperous again, to take us back to being the number one state in the Commonwealth in which to do business, in which to invest, in which to create jobs, because we certainly were not back in 2009. So we started this campaign called the 10 Big Ideas to Grow New South Wales. We figured that if we actually went around the state, had conversations with all of our members, had conversations with the broader community, and crystallised the 10 things that we believe needed to be done by the next government in New South Wales to turn the state around, to make it a better place to invest, to make it a better place to run a business, and then constantly and consistently argued that case for the two years leading up to the state election in New South Wales, that we were a chance of actually making sure that the next government in this state was going to be one that did support business, that did understand the connection between a healthy business community and a healthy broader community and the, and the, and the need to create jobs and, and economic activity. So we launched our campaign, the 10 big ideas to, to grow, New South, grow New South Wales, and we took it to both of the major parties. Uh, it was launched with Christina Keneally and Barry O'Farrell. Uh, Christina Keneally got up and said, well, it's all very nice that you come up with these 10 big ideas, but we don't really need that because we already know how to run the state properly. Uh, Barry O'Farrell stood up and said, well, here's my, go my, my alternative government's position on those 10 things. And I think at the time, about five of the 10 things that we put up the, uh, the O'Farrell government believed was a good idea and was in, uh, was in favour of. And so we, uh, we launched into that campaign. And most importantly, we changed strategy in the last six weeks before the election. 2011, going to be election in March, in the six weeks leading up to the election. And remember that conventional wisdom says that it's the six weeks before an election where voters make up their mind who they're going to vote for. We actually took our message on the road and we got this big touring bus and we painted on all sides of the bus that New South Wales deserves better. And we took it on the road and we spent those six weeks doing over 5,000 kilometres travelling throughout New South Wales. And every town that we went to, the media was there, the local chamber came out, we had an event, we actually started to explain what our 10 big ideas were. And generally, it got a lot of uh, media attention, particularly in regional New South Wales, where they were really feeling the pain and the, and the pressures that, that were being exhibited from, a, from an incompetent state government. I think the only funny moment on that trip was when we were in Port Macquarie and there was a, a whole big group of school kids who thought we were something to do with state of origin and New South Wales deserved better. <laughs> was, uh, they agreed with it, by the way. They thought New South Wales should do better. Um, but it was a really effective campaign and you could see that the coalition in particular started to wake up to what we were on about. We, had a, we took the bus to Bathurst as part of this trip and in the morning the, uh, the local Liberal Party people up in Bathurst had organised a morning tea for Barry O'Farrell to meet the people of Bathurst and at lunchtime he came to our function which was a New South Wales deserves better 10 big ideas uh, lunch that we had. At the morning tea that the Liberal Party had at Bathurst in the morning, there were about 11 people turned up. At our lunch, there were 120 people turned up. And I saw the light go on for Barry O'Farrell. I saw on that day he was starting to buy into what we were doing and also started to recognise the power of the local chamber movements that are in every town, every suburb, every village right throughout Australia. There is a local chamber of commerce and they are very well connected to their communities. And for Barry, it was a bit of a, a, you know, a light turning on type moment. And from that point onwards, he, he and his, his, his team became very supportive of this campaign. So what happened after they got elected? Well, I can tell you that we're coming up to the third 
uh, uh, two, two and a half years roughly of, of, of the current state government in New South Wales. Seven of our ten big ideas have already been implemented. Now we set ourselves a target of six. I can proudly say that after two and a bit years of uh, the, the, the current state government, seven of the ideas that we actually put forward as part of this platform have been implemented already. But the really important thing, beyond the fact that we got seven of the things that we wanted, and some of them were very important, like the creation of infrastructure in New South Wales to take the politics out of, out of what we build in this state, the most important thing to me is that we are still having very active conversations with the government on an ongoing basis about the three things we haven't got yet. Reducing payroll tax, uh, re reforming our, our local uh, councils so that we don't have 41 councils in Sydney, we actually have a much more manageable number, and of course the whole issue of the last two years of school where the entire school system is geared towards kids who go to university but less than 50% of kids do go to university and so we have very ineffective pathways to employment created in those last two years of school. The old state government would never have had these conversations with us. The current government has regular conversations. We are the first port of call whenever the government wants to talk to us about anything to do with jobs, education, the, the broader benefit of the community and so on and so forth. That's the key. That's the lesson we learned out of the state campaign that we ran last time, is that if you position yourself properly in the lead up to the campaign, you can then work with the incumbent government once they get elected in terms of making the changes, but you become part of the infrastructure of decision making in your area. And so that's what we are now in New South Wales. We are a part of the decision making infrastructure in New South Wales. Business has a voice, business has a seat at the table. Very different to what I inherited when I came into this job in 2009. So how does that play out in real terms? What does it actually do for you in terms of delivering benefits to you? Last year, the state government came to us and said there's a $4 billion black hole in the state workers' compensation system and if we take the traditional approach to fixing that problem we have to put workers' comp premiums up by an average of 28% in New South Wales. And we said to the state government, you put workers' comp premiums up by 28% and remember you're already more expensive than Queensland and Victoria, you will cost the New South Wales economy at least 12,500 jobs. They didn't like that answer. They didn't think that was a particularly palatable outcome, and neither did we. And so there was a lot of consultation and conversations about alternative strategies. And the alternative strategy was one where you change the workers' comp system to be more aligned with Victoria and other states, where you actually look after people who are genuinely and seriously injured uh, at work with a more generous compensation package but you change the entire emphasis of the legal, insurance and, and, and employer management systems to get people back to work much more quickly. That's what we did. The unions had their day of rage in Macquarie Street saying Barry's ripping everybody off again. We let that happen. We came out very hard in the, in the press and said this is what absolutely must be done in New South Wales to make us competitive again. The government held their nerve. They went through with the reforms. They didn't have to put up premiums. And here we are a year later, and I'm standing beside the Premier announcing that we've actually been able to just announce a reduction in workers' comp premiums by 7.5%. In fact, places like this will get a reduction of about 13% in their workers' comp premiums. Uh, and I'm told confidentially that there are more workers' comp premium cuts to come in the future. Now, I'll play for you just a little snippet of a video here, which is uh, Barry O'Farrell talking about this issue and talking about why he believes it's necessary for the Chamber uh, to be involved in these kind of conversations. Two years ago, the New South Wales Business Chamber campaigned during the state election uh, for 10 big ideas. One of those 10 big ideas was to do something about work cover premiums, which put pricing of businesses and investment out of New South Wales. That's why this announcement of an average 7.5% reduction in premiums uh, this announcement that no employer will suffer uh, an increase in their base work cover premium this year uh, and our announcement of incentives for those that have better safety records and for those who pay, uh, pay on time uh, is good for business, it's good for the economy and it's great for job creation. Look, I just want to thank uh, the New South Wales Business Chamber for all of their efforts to keep us up to the mark of reforming the work cover scheme to do a real benefit, not just to those who are injured at work who are assisted back to work those who are injured at work who can't work who now get high benefits, but importantly uh, to, uh, to assist us in delivering benefits to employers who are doing the right thing in their workplaces. So you can see 
that an influential chamber movement can actually deliver tangible benefits to you as business people. Um, anything that we can do to reduce the cost of employment is not only good for business, but it's actually good for the broader community because it creates jobs. And so we have been particularly effective in New South Wales. And so we started to find ourselves thinking about the situation that faced us at a federal level. And I said to someone the other day, we have a very uh, eerie kind of deja vu uh, effect for me, and that is I'm looking at the current uh, Gillard government federally saying, it looks and feels a lot like the Keneally government felt like when I joined back in 2000 and 2009. We have a, a government that has lost complete understanding of the connection between a healthy business community and a thriving business community, the creation of jobs and the creation of economic wealth. And there's an there's a absolute complete disconnect uh, going on. And it was exactly the same in New South Wales back in 2009. And so we decided that we would take all of the lessons that we learned from the New South Wales experience, the New South Wales campaign, and we would start to formulate a view about how we could influence the next government of Australia, how we could get ourselves at the table regularly to have that strong voice of business in policies and decisions that are taken at a national level as well. So why did we decide to do that? Well, the thing that shocks most people is to learn that there are about two million small to medium business. I call them all small business. People say to me, what's the definition of small business? Are there anything that's not big business? Because we know what big business is. So anything that's not big business, to my mind, is we'll, we'll categorise as small business. And so there are about two million small businesses in Australia. They employ seven million Australians. That's about 60% of the entire workforce. Now, when you think that uh, you know, I had a conversation uh, with the, uh, the, the Gillard government uh, and I said, you know, why don't you consult with business? And they said, oh no, we do consult with business. And I said, no, I don't mean, you know, like the, the, the 12 nights of Christmas. I don't mean that the four banks, the three miners, the two retailers and a telco. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about real business. I'm talking about the two million businesses that employ seven million Australians. Why don't you consult with them? There's no ear uh, available for that massive part of the economy to actually have a regular and important conversation with this current government. Small business generates about 60% of economic activity. 58% of GDP is created by small business. This is a massively important part of the economy. And when you think about 7 million jobs, you would, if you were a, in a logical sense, if you were a government, you would be paying a lot of attention to the needs of this group because that is a very, very large chunk of our economy and a very large chunk of our workforce. But unfortunately, that's not what's going on. When I talk to small business people, they're largely under a lot of pressure. They believe red tape is increasing. They believe it's getting harder to keep their businesses going. They believe employment is more difficult. Compliance with regulation is becoming more difficult. And a lot of them are sort of saying to me, you know, what's the point? Why should we keep going? Um, I talked to a lady the other day who has spent the last 25 years building a business down in Albury and uh, she's in her 60s and she said, I'm going to have to sell this company because none of my kids want to take it on. They've seen what this business has done to me. They don't want to inherit this business. They'd much rather go off and work for the public service because it's really easy. You get flexi days and RDOs and everything else and, and taxpayers pay for it all. Um, and so the, the, the concept of running a small business, people are starting to believe that it's getting too hard. Now, when you've got 7 million jobs on the line, when you've got 60% of the economy on the line, it's a really scary prospect that small business people are out there saying, maybe it's all getting too difficult. And I keep saying this to the government and they keep not, but I said to, to, to Julia Gillard in a meeting down in Canberra a few months back, I said, what you guys don't understand is you've gone beyond the tipping point. You've gone beyond the, I've had small business people say to me, there is so much regulation, there is so much red tape, there are so many rules that I'm gonna ignore all of it. I'm actually just going to try to run my business and make a profit and ignore all the regulations and the compliance and hope that somebody doesn't come along and belt me for it. Now, I said that to the Prime Minister and it, she looked at me like I'd crawled off a spaceship. Um, they really don't have a clue what I'm talking about and they live in this little bubble down in Canberra and I became increasingly frustrated with trying to get the message through about what's really going on out there in the real economy, not the Canberra economy, the real economy. And so this is why we started to think, well, what can we do? And every small business person I spoke to said, we're unhappy, we don't think the government understands, but what can we do? We're just one small business. But what's really important to think about is if every one of those small businesses, all two million of them, and the seven million people who depend on those small businesses' survival actually started to become a conscious movement, 
then you actually are a very, very strong political force. You can change the outcomes that, 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 that governments impose on you. That was the concept behind what we started to think about last year. You know, the most important uh, uh, consideration that I think every one of us and every government official and every politician should be thinking about constantly is the chart on the right-hand side. This chart here is an extract from the Daily Telegraph, and I apologise, it might be a little bit difficult to read. But this was just highlighting some Sydney suburbs and the level of youth unemployment in those Sydney suburbs. 32%, 37%, 35%, 40% youth unemployment. That's levels that you are seeing in some of the rust belt economies like Spain and, and those sort of countries. Um, we have a massive problem here. It is really, really difficult to employ young people, to train young people. And so what's happening is those young people are not being engaged. When you have a suburb that has 40% youth unemployment, you are not talking about an unemployment problem, you're talking about a social problem. You're talking about a crime problem. You're talking about a huge issue where you have a lot of disengaged young people and this is not good for us. I've got four kids. I don't want my kids to be in that position, but the problem is we are making it way too difficult to hire these kids. Now, when you've got a situation where you've got those levels of youth unemployment, and it's not just Sydney, I'm talking about regional centres. Regional centres are even worse in some places. When you're talking about that level of unemployment, you, you, you really, you know, you, you've got to start thinking somewhere along the line we went wrong somewhere. And, 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 you know, this is at exactly the same time where the shop union has made application to Fair Work Australia to abolish junior wage rates. Now, if you abolish junior wage rates in an award, an employer is going to sit there and say, oh, I can take on a 17-year-old kid who's got no experience and I'm going to have to spend a year training, or I can take on a 25-year-old person who's got some maturity and, and has lived life a little bit. I think I'll take the 25-year-old. And we're going to end up with even worse numbers on these charts going forward. There is a disconnect between the policy that is, that is in place at the moment and the way in which the real world works. I know uh, recently they abolished the ability to hire kids after school for two hours. You've either got to give them three hours or you can't hire them at all. This is nuts. This is crazy. We all got our first job. It's not about the money. It's not about what you get paid. It's about having to turn up and make sure you're there on time and be dressed appropriately and learning what it's like to be part of a workforce. That's why you take a job after school. It's not about, it's not about the money. And so we've kind of lost the plot in relation to how we are regulating our business world and the impact that it's starting to have on the most important people in our society, which is our young people. These are huge numbers. And I don't think anybody quite gets their head around it. The other thing that I think is really interesting is, uh, is the fact that, that government believe that they are responsible for creating jobs. Um, in fact, uh, I recall the debate between uh, President Obama and Mitt Romney in the United States, and uh, Obama was saying, you know, my administration has created 400,000 jobs, and Romney said, I'll stop you there, Mr. President, but you don't create jobs, business creates jobs, and your job is to actually help business. Governments don't create jobs, business creates jobs. And I think that's the message that has been lost in this country as well. It's business people who create jobs, not governments. And we really need to get our heads around that fact as well. So here we are. We've got high levels of youth unemployment. We've got small business people who are just about fed up and ready to give it away. How do we fix it? Well, like we were back in 2009 in New South Wales, we can either cop it on the chin or we can get active, get united, and make sure that whoever gets elected on the 15th of September actually gets what it is that we're on about and starts to change the way in which we run this country. And the only way that we're really able to do that, the only way we're able to get those two million voices and the seven million people that depend on them in some sort of united way is what I call the pyramid of power. Now when I joined four years ago, we had the local chambers of commerce like you're part of here today. And there are about 260 local chambers of commerce just in New South Wales. So in most suburbs, in most towns, in most villages, there is a local chamber of commerce and they will have anywhere from 50 members to 300 members, largely small business people. And those local chambers serve a very important role in terms of negotiating with local councils about parking meters and all sorts of things and a networking environment where people can actually do business with each other in their own towns. Fantastic. You also have these state chambers. Every, every one of the state chambers is the dominant business, business body in each of their states. And when I joined four years ago, not only was there no relationship between the state chamber and the local chambers, in fact we used to compete with each other for members, how crazy was that, there was actually no real relationship between the state chambers themselves either. 
And this goes back to a historical structure where the state chambers were effectively set up and funded simply to liaise with state governments. So there was this infrastructure that was in place, but there was no connection between any of it. And so what we did in the last four years is we've superimposed a regional infrastructure over the top of the local chamber movement. So we've created 16 regions in New South Wales. We've allocated staff like Grant and others to those regions. And we've said, right, your job is to go out there and engage with the local chambers of commerce that are in your region and help those local chambers become part of the state chamber structure. And we've been doing that for the last few years and it's been incredibly successful. I think we're now up to something like 200 odd local chambers out of the 260 that are now affiliated or going through the affiliation process with the New South Wales Chamber. And I'll tell you what that does. It means that every time I go and speak to, to Barry O'Farrell or every time I go and speak to Julia Gillard, I can now stand there and say, I represent all the business people in every part of New South Wales, in every town, in every village, in every suburb, and in the event that you don't do what is necessary, in the event that you don't do what we're asking you to do, we actually have the capacity to actually have conversations with every candidate in every seat, in every electorate, because we are connected to the community in a way that a lot of the political parties are not connected to the community. And that's actually a bit of a fear factor for politicians. I used to believe that, that politicians would do things for the good of the country, the good of the state, the good of their area. One of them said to me once, you don't understand, we are really only concerned about what gets us re-elected. Um, and I've become quite cynical about politicians and I then said, well if that's the case, I have to convince you that I can change the outcome of your election process. And the only way to do that is to start to demonstrate that you have the capacity to reach into the communities that, that, that elect them and influence the way people think. It is the only thing that they pay attention to. So that's what we have to do. We have to create this pyramid of power that allows us to exert that level of political influence. Now, sitting over the top of all of that, of course, is the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. ACCI is owned by the state chambers. Historically, there has been no real connection between the state chambers and ACCI. In fact, I used to call it the post office box in Canberra that I sent a big cheque off to every, every year. That changed last November. I now sit on the board of ACCI. My counterpart in Victoria now sits on the board of ACCI. The state chambers have taken their rightful position on the board of ACCI, so we are now running ACCI as well. So what we've achieved in the last four years is we have glued the chamber movement together. The local chambers, the regional chambers, the state chambers, the national chamber is all part of one organisation now where we are pulling it all together and saying, if we act in concert with each other, we can be the most powerful political force in this country, without question. So learn the lessons from what we did in New South Wales and start to apply it at a national level. Now, sitting over the top of all of that, I happen to sit on the World Chamber Federation board as well. Twice a year I have to go off to Paris, which my wife really hates having to accompany me on, but, um, <laughs> but that's where the head office is, so somebody's got to go. Um, and uh, I sit on the World Chamber board and, and, and it's been a really enlightening process for me because the chamber movement around the world is huge and very powerful and we've never connected into it. One day I'm going to come back and talk to you about all of that and the China opportunity and everything else, but today just focus on the bottom four levels, which is national chamber, state chambers, regional chambers and local chambers. If you can pull it all together, you become an incredibly powerful political force. That is what we have been working on and that is the group that has launched this campaign uh, in, a, in a consolidated way. So what is the campaign? Well, here are the state chambers. Now, once upon a time, when, an, when a federal election came along, each of those state chambers would stand up and say, here's what New South Wales wants. Here's what Queensland wants. Here's what Victoria wants. We came to the conclusion that this time around, this election that's coming up is so important that we've got to put our state wishes to one side and we've got to present a united business front. And it's shocked the politicians. They're a little bit unsure about what to do with it because they've not seen it ever before. Ever since Federation, we've never done this. So this is a turning point for the Chamber movement, very important, and it's, it's going to give us a lot of influence and a lot of power. I want to make this point to you, and I make it constantly, and nobody seems to believe it, but we are an apolitical organisation. We actually don't care which political party gets into power, but we absolutely care what policies they issue. So whether it's Liberal, whether it's Labor, whether it's Green, whether it's United Palmer Party or whoever takes government in this country on the 15th of September, we're never going to say you should vote for X. What we will say is these are bad policies and these are good policies. 
Now, if a government that is in power at the time takes offence at the fact that we think their policies are bad, bad luck for them. If a coalition thinks that we think their policies are bad, bad luck for them. I've already had arguments with Joe Hockey and with Tony Abbott about the paid parental leave scheme. I think it's an absolute disaster. Uh, and I've told them that. And I've said it publicly. Uh, we are an apolitical organisation. We don't pick political sides, but we will absolutely argue without fear or favour about what's best for our members. And if people are offended by that, that's a matter for them. And so that's the approach that we take. So this is the campaign. Small business too big to ignore. We actually went out to the advertising world and asked the agencies to come forward with their pitches about helping us with build this campaign and helping us run this campaign, and this was the one that won. I was really happy because this campaign was put together by a tiny little agency in Brisbane, a small business. And one of the reasons they were successful is they said, you don't have to brief us on the campaign. We know what it feels like to be in small business in this country. And that, that's why they won. They beat George Patz and all the other really big agencies. They beat them to this, to this important campaign. Now, the really good thing about this particular message is it has two meanings. The first meaning is, if you think about the fact that small business is 60% of the economy, 7 million jobs, 60% of the workforce, if you were a government, this would be the first portfolio that you would allocate to your most senior minister. You would say, it's such an important part of the economy, we better make the first minister we name the small business minister and not give them five other things to do at the same time. Make the small business minister a senior member of cabinet and have them every day out there trying to work out how to encourage small business to take on more people. Because guess what? If every small business took on one more, one more person, we have zero unemployment. So as a government, you would say, the small business sector is too big to ignore purely from an economic perspective. It, it's, it's, it's a massive part of our economy, therefore it's too big to ignore if you're a government. The second meaning, though, of this particular logo is that because we're two million people, because we employ seven million Australians, because those Australians have families who are also voters in this community, if you don't work with us, if you don't take us seriously, if you don't listen to what we want, if you don't implement our policies, we are politically too big to ignore as well. So there is an implied threat in this logo to politicians, to political parties. We are too big to ignore in a political sense as well. So we are trying to communicate that message as well. We have the reach into the communities that you should be scared of. So there is a double meaning to the, the logo that we're, that we're putting out there. The objectives of the campaign were pretty simple. We wanted to communicate to small business people that you're not alone. We know what you're battling. We know you're working 15 hours a day. We understand the torment you're going through in terms of compliance. We understand the stupidity of some of the forms that you're made to fill out. We understand what you're going through and we wanted to communicate that. We also wanted to communicate to politicians. Take us seriously or we will affect your chances at the ballot box, particularly in marginal electorates. We will influence the mind of voters. The second thing that we wanted to do was we wanted to increase our level of influence, not really in the lead up to the election. People have said to me, you won't change the outcome of the election. I said, well, that's possibly right. I think we might in some marginal seats, but you're probably right. But that's not what it's about. It's about what happens next year and the year after once the government is elected, like it is in New South Wales. We are still achieving benefits of our old 2010 campaign today in 2013. So it's about ongoing influence, ongoing voice. Then, of course, there's growth. You, I showed you the pyramid of power before. Imagine if you get more members of local chambers, more members in the regions, more members at a state level, more members nationally. The more members we have in the chamber movement, the more powerful we become. So I'm looking for membership growth as well. I absolutely say that in an honest sense. And finally, brand positioning. No more pay mail and style. This is a chamber movement that is united. This is a chamber movement that is powerful. This is a chamber movement that must be listened to and we have the policies that are necessary to contribute to a better Australia. So it's a brand positioning exercise as well. And so that was the objectives of the campaign itself. Three phases to the campaign. We wanted a big national launch that got a lot of publicity. The second phase was about engaging with politicians and building the grassroots of the membership and the third phase, the last six weeks, like we did in New South Wales, engaging the mind of the voters. So we had a huge launch in Western Sydney. More than 600 small business people turned up. Fantastic launch, a lot of media coverage. We launched our website where we're asking people to go and express their support for the campaign. We're 
Oh, almost 15,000 people have gone onto the website now and uh, in terms of these sorts of campaigns that's a pretty healthy number after the short period of time that we've actually been going. And we ask people to upload their own stories. Tell us your frustrations, tell us what you want to see change and we capture all of that in the website that we launched uh, at, at the launch a few, a few weeks ago. The media coverage was huge. I started the morning on Sunrise talking to Koshi. I spent the next half an hour talking to Alan Jones, who's become our absolute crusader. I've spent the, I spent another, which is not surprising, I guess. But I've got to say this, it's nice to have him for you rather than against you. <laughs> I then spent half an hour talking to John Laws, um, did all the media during the day, and at 9.30 that night I was still going on Paul Murray Live, and so we had a lot of media during, during the, the launch day and it was incredibly successful. I'll show you the ad that we started to play uh, on, on television networks uh, that day. But that uh, print ad that you can see there on the, on the right hand side, that, uh, that print ad went in all metropolitan newspapers for two weeks, all major regional newspapers for two weeks, trying to get the, the community to understand what it is that we were on about and how important small business was. But this is the TV ad that we ran for a few weeks uh, highlighting the campaign. There are over 2 million of us in Australia, small business operators. Doing what we can to make a go of things. In a pretty tough economic environment. And a lot of people think that because we're small, we don't have it. But together, we're too big to ignore. Help make sure small business gets heard in Canberra in this election. Add your voice at toobigtoignore.org.au. <coughs> Authorised by Emma, campaign for small business Canberra. You've got to always add that bit at the end. So. That was the campaign uh, advertising that we ran. We ran radio ads on 2WS, 2GB, uh, all, all regional uh, uh, radio stations, trying to get the message out that there is this movement, it is gaining some force. And it was interesting, there was a huge impact on the politicians. Phone call, what are you guys up to? What, what, what do you want? Oh, we'll come back and tell you when we're ready. No, seriously, what do you want? And we'll come back when we're ready. You just, you just keep doing what you're doing. We'll tell you what we want when, when the time comes. So it's been really good. The politicians have all been sitting up going, what are, what are you guys on about? Which is terrific. Um, so phase two, this is where we, we continue to try to engage the, the, the small business community, but also start to engage with the pollies. And we're going to launch uh, our policy platform. Uh, Peter Anderson, who's the CEO of the Australian Chamber, is speaking at the National Press Club on the 12th of June in Canberra. And he is going to launch our policy platform. And the policy platform, we had the 10 big ideas in New South Wales. We thought 10 is a bit too high to count for federal politicians. So we're going, we're going with the four that you can't ignore. We think four they can probably get their head around. And the four that you can't ignore are these. Employment reform. Every time a factory closes, every time a shop closes, every time Ford decide not to continue to make cars in this country, jobs get get put on the line in this country. Now, should we or shouldn't we make cars? Different issue. The key issue, though, is we don't have policy settings in this country that encourage employment. And we need to have policy settings in this country that encourage employment, and particularly youth employment. And so we need significant policy reform in the, play, in the space, not just Fair Work Act, which is probably one of the most unfair acts we have in this country, but generally in areas of education, apprenticeships, traineeships, a whole range of other areas, we need an overhaul of the reform that makes it possible for small business to employ people. And that's one of the main sort of thrusts of what we're going to say. The second aspect of our four you can't ignore is tax and finance reform. Why is it that the state tax office has completely def different definitions to the federal tax office and you actually have to fill out two forms, basically giving them the same information in different forms, in different definitions, in different shapes? We've got to overhaul the tax system. Why is it that we can't have GST thresholds down to $20 instead of $1,000 so that overseas companies can't come in here without having to pay GST? Particularly when our states are short of money and they can't keep up the upgrades for our hospitals and our schools, why do we allow that to happen? There is some significant tax reform that needs to happen. The other thing that needs to happen, I put a proposal last year to the federal government that they use their balance sheet, which is a very healthy balance sheet, to support the banks lending more money to small business. It happens in the US, it happens in Canada, it happens in the UK. I put a full policy paper to the federal government last year and said this is how you can do it and it doesn't cost you anything. And they said, yeah, thanks for that, Steve, and they put it in the bin. 
well, this next government will have to listen to us because it is possible and it's done in other countries and we need to do it here because we've got to get cash funding provided to small business so they can grow, so they can expand, so they can hire more people. The third one, we've got to start killing off this whole issue of red tape. It is getting out of control. People sitting up till midnight, one o'clock in the morning, filling out ridiculous papers. We've got to kill off the whole red tape beast. It's not in the nature of government to kill off red tape. In fact, the ethos of this current government is you should legislate and regulate until there is no risk left in society. That's their ethos. Every time you see a risk or a problem, legislate, regulate. Since the Gillard government was ele ele last elected, 21,000 pieces of new regulation and legislation have been implemented. It's gone beyond the joke. And it's in the nature of governments to do this. And guess who administers all of that red tape? More public servants, which means that we are having an even bigger deficit. And now the government is borrowing to pay for the deficit. There's no problem borrowing money to build infrastructure. There's a huge problem borrowing money to pay your recurrent spending. And every business person knows that and every householder knows that. And we've got to start killing off this whole red tape monster. It's getting bigger and bigger. And finally, where there are some really important pieces of infrastructure that we need to get on with building. The second airport at Badgerys Creek will create 20,000 jobs in Western Sydney and is a huge economic piece of economic infrastructure. Let's just put the fence up and put a sign on it and say, we actually are going to build an airport here one day. Let's start the process of getting it happening. Let's get the West Connex underway. Let's finish the Pacific Highway. These are things that are important. So they're the four you can't ignore. They're the things that we are going to launch on the 12th of June and we're going to prosecute right up until the end of the, of the election campaign itself. There is a direct mail campaign going out at the moment. Have any of you received this yet? In the next week or so, you will actually get this postcard down in the left-hand bottom corner there. You'll get one of those in your mailbox because we have a database of every single employing business in New South Wales and we are sending that to 275,000 employing businesses in New South Wales in the next two weeks. It's going to cost us about $200,000 to do it. We're working with a direct mail house to do it. And we've actually modified the postcard so that local chambers of commerce logos are incorporated into the direct mail piece. So everybody in Caring Bar, everybody in Miranda, everybody in Cronulla, everybody in the Shire who employs somebody will get one of these mail pieces and allow this chamber and other chambers to follow up and have more conversations with people about the campaign that we're running. That will hit in the next two weeks. Then, beyond that, the issue is to what extent will the people who are already engaged, like yourselves, start having conversations with other suppliers, other clients, other customers who walk in the door, your staff. To what extent can we get this movement actually rolling? That's the big challenge that we've got. In the last six weeks, we try to influence the voters. We try to say to the voters, when you go to the ballot box, think about one thing, and that is, if you've got kids, somebody is going to have to give them a job and those somebody are business. So you've got to think about which party has the policies that is going to stimulate the economy, create more taxes for the government to be able to pay for the things that you want, like the NDIS, like Gonski, and create jobs for your kids in the future. Which of the parties has got the best policies to do that? That's the aim of the last six weeks, to influence the mind of the voters. And, so, and that's the thing that politicians are most scared of. So we've actually gone out like the bus campaign. We've thought, well, let's do the bus, but let's do it on an even bigger scale. We've gone out and we've hired the biggest mobile billboard in the Southern Hemisphere. This is it. Uh, it currently resides in Brisbane, um, and we are having the artwork and everything prepared for it now. And it will set off on its journey on the 6th of August and spend the next six weeks traveling throughout New South Wales. That's to give you some feel for the scale of this thing. It is absolutely enormous. Now we've been really clever and we've actually invented a, uh, a slight change to the way in which the billboard works and we've created the small business lounge which sits underneath the billboard. And so we're going to be able to take this billboard into every town, every village, every suburb that we go through, set it up somewhere in the, in the main part of the, 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 the main street or the high street and invite everybody to come around and have a coffee or have a sausage sizzle, have a glass of wine, have a beer with us, whatever the time of the day it happens to be. Preferably the beer and the wine is at night and the coffees are in the morning, but I guess it's, there's some towns that might be the reverse. Um, and we'll have the small business lounge and we'll have seats there and people can come in and tell us their stories and we'll video their stories and we'll find out what they're frustrated about and we'll take this campaign on the road for the last six weeks 
it will get a lot of media, it will get a lot of attention, particularly in those regional towns where not much goes on and suddenly they wake up one morning and this massive thing is in their main street. And so this is kind of where we're going to go on the six week campaign, we'll take it all over, all over New South Wales, we'll put it up in front of Parliament House and be asked to politely move along, I'm sure. Um, but it's great because it's mobile. It takes about an hour to set up and about an hour to pull down. So we've got the six week course pretty much marked out where it is that we're going to go. We're actually going to start at the big pineapple in Queensland. Um, it's big, it's too big to ignore. And small business has been getting the rough end of the pineapple for a long time. So we'll, we'll start the campaign there. We'll have a bit of a press release and we'll, we'll hit the road. Uh, we'll probably go down to Wayne Swan's electorate and have one there. He'll be happy about that. Um, and then you know, we'll stop at the big banana and the big prawn and the big oyster and all the other bigs that are around the, the state and have press conferences in front of those and so on and so forth. So the last six weeks is about capturing the imagination of the voters uh, and taking this massive billboard on the road and, the, and the, uh, the small business lounge on the road. So how can you support what it is that we're trying to do? First of all, if you haven't gone onto the website, logged on and said, yes, we support this campaign, I'd really like you to do that. And any of your friends, your family, your staff, or your colleagues, or your clients, or your suppliers, or your customers, if you could encourage them to do the same, that would be really helpful because the more numbers we get up on that counter, the better. I wanted to get an uh, Indian call centre to sit there and just keep doing this, but nobody would let me do that. Um, so we've got to do it the right way, we've got to do it the genuine way, so it would be great if everybody could, could do that for, for starters. Secondly, it's really important that you have conversations. I reckon most of the seven million employees of small business most of them are really loyal to the businesses they work for. In fact, they will passionately tell you why their business is a great business. But I don't think that most small business people share the burdens that are put on them in terms of running the business. They tend to hide that from the staff to some extent. I think the time has come for us to tell them. I think the time has come to say, look, do you understand what this government is doing to us in terms of the viability of this business? We've got to start sharing it into the community in a bigger way. But if every one of you could just tell five people, that would be a huge spin-off in terms of getting the campaign rolling and getting it moving. If ever you get the chance to talk to the media, tell them, particularly local press. Ring up the local press and say, you've got to get behind this small business campaign. It really has a very powerful effect. And most importantly of all, after you talk to your staff, how about talk to your local politician? They are very sensitive in the lead up to an election, particularly in an election like this one. Get in their ear, ring them up and say, hey, what do you think about this campaign? Where do you stand on small business? What is your party going to do to help small business? They get very sensitive about this time of year. You can put a poster up in your shop window if you run a retail outlet. I've had a number of uh, companies come to me and say they run big fleets of courier vans and all those sorts of things. They want to put big stickers in the back windows of their, of their vans or, or whatever. Have a think about how you can actually get the collateral out there to get the message out that what it is that we're trying to achieve. I just wanted to finish, I guess, by indicating to you that we should never give up. We won't give up, Chamber won't give up, I certainly won't give up. I'm up for this fight big time um, because I think that if we let small business suffer, it is going to be bad for all Australians. And I don't think most people appreciate that. That's the, that's the challenge we have. How do we get the message out there that the engine room of this economy, the thing that creates our wealth and our stability and our employment and our standard of living is actually the small business sector. That's our big challenge. So if you come together as a movement and if you exert enough political pressure you will start to see change and I've already started to see it. I've seen now both parties start to come out and start to talk about their small business credentials. This is the beginning. When Tony Abbott released his Fair Work Australia policy, although it didn't go far enough for my liking, they were very quick to point out that there were specific things in there to look after small business. That's where you start to see you're getting traction in a campaign when every time they get up they want to talk about the special bits for small business. That's when you know you're starting to get some traction. Change can happen, but everybody's got to get united and make it happen. If you sit back and go, I'm just a small business, what can I do? Government can do things to me and there's no, there's no way back. It's not right. We can. We can change things. Here's uh, a lady who uh, runs a cafe down in Coogee, and uh, this is uh, when we announced the, the reduction in workers' comp. Uh, uh, Barry O'Farrell went in and bought a coffee from her, and we happened to uh, have a chat to her about, about her views on things. Um, I'll just play that for you now. This government in New South Wales has just shown 
that if you're prepared to do the hard yards, if you're prepared to take some of the decisions that are necessary, even though at the time they might not be universally popular, that this is the way that true leaders operate in the political system, and it's certainly something we expect to continue to press in terms of the way the next government in this country operates. A thousand things, a thousand things we can have more staff on. We don't have to work as many hours as we already do. Everyone works so hard in such a short period of time, so it takes the pressure off me, it takes the pressure off the staff. We can inject more money into our business, that would make it grow. Just the small things of another paint job or better facilities in the kitchen. Small business, they're, they're very personal. I know people, they have that real integration into the community. You get the positive feedback from customers. You think, it's great, I love it. So ladies and gentlemen, um, we'll give everything we've got. What I ask of you is to support the campaign, tell everybody about it and don't lose faith because we will prevail. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to take any questions or comments or observations or even criticisms. I'm prepared to cop as well. Excellent. <laughs> That's really good. Um, I like to see local politicians come along because it saves me having to explain it later. <laughs> so any observations then, Mark? Uh, look, um, just a couple of observations, one point one, one back. I, I generally agree with uh, everything you've said. And uh, we as a government are very keen to uh, get small business moving and use that wire. So I'm glad we've got a score out of the 7 out of 10 so far. Uh, the only criticism I would make is um, I don't agree with your cynical view of politicians. Um, <laughs> Uh, as, uh, as unbelieving as it may seem, I think uh, most of my colleagues are going to make New South Wales a better place. Uh, we disagree constantly, vigorously and robustly about how we do it. Uh, but I don't think most of us are looking at that over our shoulder the whole time, worrying about the next election. I think we're, we're there to make it a better place. I think someone like Barry O'Farrell, uh, while he's always got his eye on the union polls and uh, eye on politics and obviously conscious about um, the next election, uh, we'd all be wasting our time if we just need to get re-elected and not do things. So we as a government, I think all my colleagues are keen to get things done. Glad we've got 7 out of 10 so far and I hope we can get 10 out of 10. Thank you very much. Sure. Australians have a lot of sympathy and empathy for farmers. We sort of always seem, you know, when there's drought we feel sorry for them, there's floods we feel sorry for them. Um, the manufacturers that I know at this, this stage, I'm now starting to view them like farmers. They just don't know when they wake up today whether they're going to have a flood, whether they're going to have a, a bloody bushfire, or, or what the day is going to be. Their order books used to be three months in advance. These days, if they've got three weeks in advance, they're really happy. Mm. And there's no reserves left in the cupboard. So I sort of hope that your national and state levels that, that the executive understand that at, at really at a small business level, if there's another major shock, they're all gone. It's interesting with manufacturing because every time I talk to governments about manufacturing, and here again I, I talk about federal government because these days federal governments control a lot more of the levers for business than, than state governments do. And they always say, oh, there's no future for manufacturing because the high dollar and we're a high cost society and so on and so manufacturing won't be able to compete. And I say that's absolute rubbish. Manufacturing in this company, country can compete because we are one of the most innovative countries in the world. We keep inventing new things, we keep inventing new systems, we keep working out products that are necessary, and just to our north is a massive consumer market that wants to buy the things that we make and the things that we grow. And what really disappoints me is, I was in China recently with a trade mission and I came back from there seeing this enormous consumer market up there that desperately wants to buy things that are grown and manufactured in a pristine environment like Australia. And I was driving through Griffith and I looked across and there was a massive field of beautiful oranges that were sitting in the field and I said, what's all that about? They said, oh, they're going to plough them back into the earth. And I said, why is that? And they said, oh, well, the last canner is closed and uh, basically it, uh, Woolworths and Coles won't pay them what they're worth to, to have it, so they're just going to plough the oranges back into the ground. And I'm saying, there's a policy disconnect here somewhere big time because there's a massive market to the north that would love to have the juice from those oranges or the oranges themselves or whatever it may happen to be. I've said to the government that the big problem in terms of manufacturing is you won't get out of the way. We will innovate our way around things like the high dollar. We will find solutions. 
to manufacturing in this country, but you can't tie their hands behind their back and ask them to do that at the same time. Get out of the, get out of the way of manufacturers. Stop making it too difficult to do manufacturing. And it just bounces off. You know, we've got to hope that there's some sense in the next government that there is a change of heart in terms of the way they do it. But you're absolutely right. But there is a future for manufacturing in this country, absolutely. Steve, uh, Rob Salisbury, SRI, uh, Australia, SRI, Asia. We've been in Asia the last 10 years. I've been a PR of Australia for about 15, 18 years now. Um, you know the movie Money, Moneyball? Game changer. Uh, statistics made a huge impact on a 120-year-old game in the U.S. And they, Oakland A's did a great job with a small team and a big budget. Um, what do you think would be the game changers for us locally in four to six months after your campaign sort of hit the ground? Because here we are sitting here this morning, and it's all great, but really locally, what can we do to influence that as a game changer for us? Because it's, it's painful, but it's also realistic that there's going to be some really good things happening. Do you mean what policy changes will, will have the greatest impact, or do you mean what can the local community do to actually change well, things? Well, questions, but the same way. Thanks, Richard. <laughs> Appreciate it. No, that's fine. Um, I, I think, as I said, I tried to sort of say during the presentation that the big benefit or opportunity we have is grassroots movement. Yeah. Because grassroots movement is, is if we can connect with every suburb, town and village in New South Wales, you are a political force to be dealt with. You've got better infrastructure, better reach into the communities than the political parties do. The issue is, do the local chambers actually want to pick up the opportunity and run with it? Because, because local chambers are quite well respected in their, in their suburbs, their towns, their villages, and they know most people in the towns, suburbs and villages. And I often say to people, when there is a flood, when there is a fire, when there is these things happen, who's the first to put on the SES uniform? The small business people who, who, who run the shops and the, and the factories in the towns and so on and so forth. So people are really well connected. Politically, it's a huge benefit. The issue is, are we prepared to use it or not? Are we prepared to come together and start to exert some influence? In terms of the main game changes after the next election, uh, I think that uh, in it, if, 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 if my experience with the O'Farrell government is anything to go by, you'll see that the next government in this country will have to spend a couple of years repairing the economy. And you won't see some instant tangible benefits. I had to laugh, I was listening to the radio about two weeks after Barry got elected Premier. And this guy, it was Talkback Radio, and he ran and he said, Bloody O'Farrell got elected, he promised to fix things, and I'm still sitting in traffic. And it was two weeks after he got elected. Um, <laughs> So I don't think you're going to miraculously wake up on the 16th of September and find that your life as a business person has suddenly become incredibly easy. It's going to take time. But I do believe two, three years along the way, if we keep up the dialogue, if we continue to say, these are the things that need fixing, these are the things that, that need repairing, I suspect you'll start to see the really big changes in the second term of the next government when they've had an opportunity to come in, let the Productivity Commission do its reviews, start to implement the changes. Abolition of the carbon tax will help. <laughs> that will be a big start. I mean, what a, what a ludicrous, ludicrous tax that carbon tax is. It is nuts. If, if, if I ever thought that it was going to change the level of carbon in the atmosphere globally, I would support it. But it doesn't. It just, it just imposes more cost on Australian business and Australian households for zero return in terms of atmospherics and, and environmental protection. So, that you'll see fairly quickly. Things like the fair work system will take its time to work its way through. So I think don't be too impatient, but believe, like in New South Wales, that in the coming years, as long as business has that conduit into the government, we will start to be able to see the changes. Hi, Karen from the State of Research. I love the economic rate. As a small business owner, the biggest frustration was your second point of financing. Does the Chamber have a policy once you've gone through this election to work with the banks to really you know, start willing to talk about all the campaigns and sort of supporting small business that really doesn't follow through? Yes, and that's the policy I put to the government. Um, the way the policy works, and this is what happens in the UK, Canada and the US, so it's not like we're trying something that hasn't been proven somewhere else. The government goes to the major bank and, and lending institutions and says, you have your lending criteria which says these companies make it, and I think the way the banks work in this country is if you don't need to borrow the money, then we'll lend it to you. That's how it pretty much works. Um, and then there are a group of companies who are sort of outside the bank's normal lending range, but 
good quality companies with, with good assets, and, uh, but, but they fall outside the normal lending range that the bank would be prepared to, to do, which is almost zero risk. The way the system works in other countries is the government uses its balance sheet to guarantee 75% of those loans. And so the bank is only taking a risk on 25%. And the bank then says, well, if I'm only taking a risk on 25%, I'm going to be much more generous with my lending policies because I'm only taking that smaller risk. The, the loan actually attracts a slightly higher interest premium, and the additional interest over and above the bank's interest rate is used to create a, a cross-subsidised insurance fund so that the ones that do go broke, the ones that do leave the bank with a bad debt, are subsidised by that fund. And it, the banks have to still apply their normal risk assessments to these things because they are, they are taking a risk on 25% of the loan but the other 75% is covered or underwritten if you like by that, by that cross subsidised fund. It works in other countries, it can absolutely work here, the current government thought it was all too hard and so they just put it in the bin. Now the big banks in this country have had a huge amount of taxpayer support, a huge amount of government support, they are making record profits, forget the mining industry, the banks are making the record profits in this country. They at least owe it to us to actually engage with that kind of, of fund and in the event the government's prepared to do it, the chambers will come out really hard and support that activity. We've done all the hard work, we've written the policy papers, we've given them the overseas experiences, it can be done. All we've got to do is have some political will. You've got to have a treasurer who says to the banks, guys, we've underwritten you through the GFC, now it's your turn to actually help us pay back and get this economy moving again. So. I've just done some research for a seminar I'm doing tomorrow uh, in the Aurora on cash flow. 73 percent of small businesses fund their business through credit card. Yeah. We all know what the credit card interest rates look like. Uh, the CPA survey just came out, uh, the 2012 survey just came out where uh, 42 percent of refinance during 2012 was for business survival. Something's going to happen. Yep. Um, you know, I agree with all your sentiments. Uh, and it's definitely the message out. You know, we've got, I think it was 2 million small businesses. Correct. That employs 7 million Australians. Australians. Correct. And, uh, what are we as a country? 23, 24 million, if not? People, but only yeah. about 16 million in the workforce. So, so it's half of that. Yeah. Um, you're right. A lot of the businesses that, that end up in the administration, the employer is uh, over the world to that business. Right. But a lot of the business owners, and, and maybe it's a, I, I don't know what it is, maybe business owners want to keep their things themselves or they're very humble about their, about their business, but at the end of the day, business owners, employers need to tell their employees how tough business really is. I agree. The employees don't see the business owner working 15, 18 hours a day, and the financial pressure, and the personal financial pressure that it has on the, the family unit of the business. Uh, so if it, even if business owners just open up to their employees and say, okay, guys, this is what it's like to run a business, all of a sudden you're actually going to get that message out to quite a bit. Exactly. And they're the constituents that actually go to the polls every year. Correct. Um, because let me tell you, every small business at this moment, in my opinion, is in threat. I agree. Of, of survival, given those statistics. I, and, and, and your point about cash flow is absolutely spot on. In fact, I don't know if you saw, but Joe Hockey announced recently that he's picked up a suggestion that we've been hammering on about, which is when a government department doesn't pay you in 30 days, you don't have to ask for the interest to be added on. It gets added on automatically. So it actually, it actually doesn't penalise, because a lot of small businesses say, oh, I'm not going to ask for the penalty interest rate to be applied because I won't get the next contract. So if it becomes government policy that that interest is automatically applied, fantastic. Then the second issue becomes, what about big business? What about the BHPs who say to you, yes, you can have a contract with us, but we have a 90-day payment cycle, take it or leave it, because we're really big and we can do that kind of stuff. I, one of the real problems is that the, in the current federal government, there is almost zero business experience. If you look at all the people in cabinet, you look at all the people in the government, there is almost nobody who's ever been in business. Almost nobody who's ever put their assets on the line, who's stayed awake at night worrying how they're going to pay the bills, worrying how they're going to pay the staff, not paying themselves, I did it. I built businesses for 20 years. I absolutely know what it feels like to wake up with that cold sweat saying, how am I going to make my, my, my bills this, this week? 
Nobody in that government has that experience. In fact, I talked to a senior member of the current government about small business, and I said, the biggest problem for small business is cash flow, and he said, what's cash flow? <laughs> and I can promise you that was a legitimate conversation. So we have a huge challenge on our hands, and, and, and I think that hopefully the next government will have a much greater appreciation of the issue of cash flow, and that's one of the things we're going to focus on quite heavily. Right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, we've got, we're just running out of a bit of time, so we've just got a few things. Steve's got a busy schedule today, so I just want to thank everybody for the questions, and Steve's great presentation, so I just want to welcome and say thank you to Steve.